excited this morning to be in Esther, Esther chapter 8 and 9. If you've been with us, you know we've been walking through this book. We're going to be in 8 and 9 in the beginning, and then we're going to finish the end of 9 and all of 10, uh, which is just a couple of verses next week, uh, and that will be well, that will be one book down. We'll be, uh, be Esther, uh, we can check it off the list. It's not means we don't go back to it, but uh, but it means we've, we've walked through it. You can go online uh, and uh, check out all the sermons if you've missed them so that you can kind of just be sure that you're in there. As you kind of look at 8 and chapter 9, you could clearly read past some of these things because it's like just the details. It's just the details of like what happens now that uh, Morde- uh, Mordecai is now raised into leadership, Haman is dead, and there's going to be this crazy situation that happens on March the 8th and March the 9th, and you could just kind of blow by it, and we could honestly, next week, you'd be like, oh, 9 and 10, it's just a celebration, but I think God has something to say to us. I think he has something to say to us from the high points of scripture where we're like, oh man, this is a great passage, this is a great passage, this is a great passage, but also just the mundane in our lives, because I don't know about you, but there's some days of my life that are just mundane things, right? They're just consistently, they're just walking it out. And we can learn how believers, followers of Christ, how Christians act in those moments. Uh, so we have been asking kind of this question all all, all, uh, all series long, uh, just so what, right? So what? Uh, we're in the book of Esther. We're kind of in this history book and we're looking at it. And we, we've asked the question, so what? Why does this story about Xerxes, Queen Esther, Mordecai, Haman, why does it matter to me? And we said last week that this story is our story, right? Um, because we never see the name of the Lord uh, in this uh, story. And we know that sometimes God does work through the miraculous in our lives, but most often he doesn't work by parting the Red Sea, but he works by a steady, faithful, consistent decisions that I make under the wisdom uh, of the Holy Spirit and others make to get us to the place where we can see God at work. We don't often see these big, uh, you know, part the Red Sea moments and go, oh man, this is what we're supposed to do, right? There are moments in our lives like that, but for the most part, it's just steady faithful walking, walking and reading his word, allowing it to soak into our lives and allowing the spirit to really challenge us to be more than we ever thought we could be. And this week we'll continue in the story in chapters eight and nine. And I want to give you kind of just four divisions in Esther eight and nine, and then apply this to our lives. So uh, uh, four divisions kind of as you see it in this, in these two chapters, the first division is this, the existing edict. It's where we uh, last ended last week. There's still this existing edict where the Jews will be killed and they will be wiped out of the uh, the the you know the Persian Empire because this decree has been made by Haman and the, and the decree could not be uh, taken away. So let's jump in to Scripture, uh, chapter eight, verse one. It says this: On that same day, King Xerxes gave the property of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Queen Esther. Then Mordecai was brought before the king, for Esther had told the king how they were related. The king took off his signet ring, which is kind of like uh, his I'm in charge ring, right? Uh, Which he had taken back from Haman and he gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai to be uh, in charge of Haman's property. Uh, Then Esther went again before the king, falling down at his feet and begging him with tears to stop the evil plot devised by Haman the Agagite against the Jews. Again, the king held out his gold scepter to Esther, so she rose and stood before him. And Esther said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor with him, and if he thinks it is right, and if I am pleasing to him, let there be a decree that reverses the orders of Haman, son of Hamadetha the Agagite, uh, the Agagite, who ordered that Jews throughout all the king's provinces should be destroyed. For how can I endure to see my people and my family slaughtered and destroyed? Remember, she had kind of let the cat out of the bag that she is a Jewish woman and she's married to the king of Persia. Then King Xerxes said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, I've given Esther the property of Haman and he has been impaled on a pole because he tried to destroy the Jews. Now go ahead and send a message to the Jews in the king's name, telling them whatever you want and seal it with the king's signet ring. But remember that whatever has already been written in the king's name and sealed with his signet ring can never be revoked. We see that there is this existing edict. Remember that the existing edict could not be revoked. You couldn't just couldn't just write out another edict that said, hey, forget this thing. It's okay. We're not going to do that. 
jinx, uh, 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 just messed up. Sorry, uh, messed it, uh, messed it all up. It's just like uh, you know, just j just JK, right? There's no text, JK text at this moment. You don't you don't send that out. And so Mordecai uh, is now in Haman's spot as the leader of Persia, and he has the king's signet ring. We have not shared this scripture um, throughout this journey through Esther, but I think it's, uh, I think it's appropriate for, for us to think about this. Daniel 2, 21. It says this, that, that God places the kings where he would. He places people in hierarchy and order. He puts people where they should be when they should be there. He raises them up to leadership when they should. And so Mordecai is now in this leadership spot. He's not the king, but he's second in charge. And there's this existing edict. And he says, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to send out something to all the Jewish people so that they can kind of respond in that way. You can't just slide it away, but you can do something other than that. So as we continue, we find kind of the second division here in chapter eight, and it is the second edict or the second decree. Uh, uh, would you join with me as we read verses 9 through 14 uh, today uh, as we kind of continue in this second edict? So on June 25th, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Mordecai dictated. It was sent to the Jews and to the highest officers, the governors, and the nobles of all the 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. And the decree was written in the scripts and languages of all the people of the empire, including that of the Jews. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Mordecai sent the dispatches by swift messengers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king's service. So just imagine in your mind, right? This is from India to Ethiopia. So when you think of India uh, and then you think of the Middle East traveling all through that way and then all the way down through Egypt into, uh, into uh, Ethiopia. Can I tell you that, uh, did you know this? Uh, a lot of people, when you say this, they're like, they're shocked. Do you know Egypt is in Africa? I just want to make sure if I, if, if that's new to you today, it's okay. Uh, you join a lot of uh, people uh, that, that are there, but it, all this whole expanse, they're traveling, right? This is not just some easy deal. Like it's not just, Hey, we're texting it out. Hey, we're emailing it out, but it is an, it is, it is a significant journey that is taking place. And just imagine all the scripts, all the languages, they need to be covered and, and understood. And they have to kind of redo what they had kind of done earlier. Verse 11, it says this, the king's decree gave the Jews, this is the second one, in every city authority to unite, to defend their lives. They were allowed to, same words as in the first decree, kill, slaughter, and annihilate anyone of any nationality or province who might attack them or their children and wives, and to take the property of their enemies. That last and is important. The day chosen for this event throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes was March 7th of the next year. So it's June 25th that this is being sent out all the way to March 7th. They're sending it out and they're preparing and ready. Remember, they, they had kind of drawn lots, cast lots to see when that day was going to be. And so they say on the 7th, just like the time where those people were going to come against the Jews and wipe them out, on that day, you are called to defend yourselves. You can kill, uh, uh, murder, annihilate, slaughter, uh, who Whoever comes against you, verse 13 says this, a copy of this degree, decree was to be issued as law in every province and proclaimed to all peoples so that the Jews would be ready to take revenge on their enemies on the appointed day. So urged on by the king's command, the messengers rode out swiftly and fast horses bred for the king's service. The same decree was also proclaimed there in the fortress of Susa. We see the second Edict. The second edict is simple. Jewish people, defend yourselves. Defend yourselves. Um, I, I'm not sure if they needed that second edict or not. Um, uh, I, I don't know if they would have not, just not defended themselves uh, uh, after the first edict, but I'm pretty sure they would have done something. But now they're able to kill, annihilate, and slaughter, and there will be no regard for what happens. And it just says simply, defend yourselves. And take all the plunder of those who come against you. Kill, slaughter, annihilate them. Now listen, I, um, this gives uh, me great pause as, uh, as a pastor to begin thinking of like, Frank, 
How does this square with everything in our world going on today? How does this square with war in the Old Testament? And, and what, about, what about those people? Do they have an opportunity to hear the gospel? Do they have an opportunity to know? Do they have an opportunity to trust? Now, uh, that's above my pay grade, right? Uh, that is above everybody in this room's pay grade. The Lord knows uh, everything. We've said throughout this book that he knows uh, the end from the beginning. He sees from the top down, not like the bottom up, like we're looking, right? Uh, but I want to tell you, if you were in uh, DeSoto County at all uh, on, was that uh, Saturday? Was it Saturday? Friday night? And you walked out and tried to see the Aurora Borealis, or if you got pictures from somebody else that saw it. Thanks, y'all. Uh, I was too, I'm in bed by midnight. It's one o'clock. I walked out and saw a little haze, uh, a little pink haze, uh, or, or maybe purple haze. Right? Is that good? Jimi Hendrix there? Uh, any, any fans? I saw a little purple haze out there, and I was like, we're too much in the city. Man, we should have been out in the country somewhere. Uh, and, uh, but you saw it. And I just want to tell you that the earth screams, the earth screams of the Lord. Just look around this room. Would you look around? Look around. I know you don't normally look around, but look around this room. God has some creativity. He's hilarious too. Uh, uh and I'm pointing to myself, right? He's, he's, he's amazing, Right. You, you look around and uh, uh, you, you just see like uh, some of us have brown eyes, some of us have blue eyes, some of us have more melanin in our skin than others, right? Some of us can tan, some of us can't, some of us have hair, some of us don't have hair. Some of us are all over the map, right? He's just, it's just interesting and amazing. God is a creative God and everything, everything in this earth that has been created gives witness to him. And listen, he knows if you will come and you will respond and you will, uh, you will give your life. Listen, these nations in the Old Testament, many of them had worshiped other gods for so long that they would not turn. But I want to tell you, it's not against God to do that, right? Enter in book of Jonah, right? Where, where Jonah is the prophet who was running from God. He's, he's the, it's such, such a crazy book, right? He's running from the Lord, not wanting to be obedient. And he's like, God, I didn't want to go to Nineveh. You want to know why I didn't want to go to Nineveh? Because I knew that you would share the good news of who you are and they would turn to you and they would respond in repentance and faith. And Jonah, at the end of the book, it's really sad. He's angry. He's angry at God for revival, right? He's angry at God for revival. I told Ann early on in our ministry career, if I ever, uh, if I ever get angry about 250 to uh, 150 to 250,000 people uh, coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, punch me in the neck, right? I mean, what a moron in that moment. He's angry about people turning from the Lord. The Lord knows. And he gives them the second edict and he says, listen, defend yourself against those who will come against you. We see this third division and it's the edict response. It's the edict response. It's the response to what the people hear and what they do. Continue with me in chapter eight, verses 15 through 17. It says this, then Mordecai left the king's presence wearing the royal robe of blue and white, the great crown of gold and an outer cloak of fine linen and purple. Um, can I just say this is an unreal moment, right? Mordecai, the last time he was uh, uh, told about the first edict, what did he do? He ripped his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes and went to the gate. He was distraught and now he is wearing the king's robes and he is wearing the king's signet ring and he is walking in power and might. If you haven't yet uh, gotten on, uh, whether it be YouTube or on their BibleProject.org uh, website uh, and watch the videos, they're so great. I'll tell you how you can get there. You can go uh, to the Right Now Media app and you can click, when you open up your app, there's a Simple Church logo on there. You can press the Simple Church logo and then it will bring up all our messages uh, and then all of uh, all of the Bible Project videos there. You can just click right on it. It'll go right there, and you can watch this. And it's just unreal. When you, I should have put the picture on the screen, but it has like these this kind of this picture. Like if you square here, square here, square here, square here, and then two squares. That's chapter five and six, and then seven, eight, nine, and ten. And you can see the parallels. The writer that was writing was an unreal at what he was doing. 
And so we see this moment where Mordecai is now wearing the cloaks of the robe. He's, he's got uh, this great crown of gold and an outer cloak of fine linen and purple. And the people of Susa celebrated the new decree. The Jews were filled with joy and gladness and were ordered, uh, were honored everywhere. In every province and city, wherever the Jews' decree arrived, the Jews rejoiced and had a great celebration and declared a public festival and holiday. Uh, and many of the people of the land became Jews themselves, for they feared what the Jews might do to them. I mean, this is an unreal. We see the response to the edict. There's people rejoicing and celebration uh, on the part of the Jewish people. There's Jewish people who are celebrating, obviously, right? I mean, you're so thankful. I can now defend myself. I'm, I'm not going to be brutally murdered and killed. That's something to rejoice about, right? But there's other people who are all rejoicing. It says uh, that many people became Jews. What? They, 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 many people of the land were like, hey, this is so awesome. This is unreal. I'm going to join in with you. And can I just tell you, when we kind of think about these things happening, this is a, I, I want to tie strings to the Bible for us so that we can see the promises of God coming true. This is a promise that was given in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham. He said, listen, those that would bless you, those that, that you would be a blessing to, those that will listen and obey and follow, they can be foreigners, they can be of any nation, but come. And this promise is coming true that he will have as many kids as the sands on the seashore, but that he will then be a blessing to the nations. Listen, it's always been about the nations. It's always been about the nations. This uh, turnabout came because uh, of the fear of the Jews. It says this uh, there at the, the last verse in verse 17. And many of the people of the land became Jews themselves, for they feared what the Jews might do to them. Remember that they are an exiled people. They're an exiled people. And they're concerned about what the Jews will do to, do to them. Can I just tell you that I don't think it's as much about the Jews as much as it is about the Jewish God, Yahweh, that they are fearful of the God, the God that we worship and serve. Why? Because the stories have been told on, uh, on repeat for year after year after year, how they conquered Egypt and walked out the Exodus, right? The stories have been told about how all the Canaanite peoples had been kind of come under their control. Their story would be known. It's a thousand years uh, prior where they walked out of Egypt. Can I tell you that we talk about stories a thousand years ago, right? Uh, we still think about the medieval uh, ages. We talk about, that's a thousand years back from us right now where we are. We talk about the medieval ages. We study it in history. And so they, you can imagine there were still stories of what their God had done. There was this celebration that was happening, but there was also this moment of fear uh, that happened in this moment. A thousand years from the moments where they walked out of Egypt and walked into the promised land and kind of utterly destroyed the Canaanite people. But can I, can I just ask this question? Because let's be honest, uh, in this moment when the decrees have been given, when the decrees have been shared, what changed? What changed? What changed in that moment? The answer is this, nothing. Nothing changed in that moment. Right there. Just think if you're in a you're in a province that maybe is a two day horse ride away from Susa. So it was given on June 25th. They get on the horse. It's two days now. Now it's June 27th and they get this celebration decree. Right. What has really changed? You still have many, 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 many months to wait before all this happens. And I want to tell you that I think this should be a picture of what joy should be for you and for me. We're going to apply this to our lives a little bit later. But listen, sometimes in the middle of the muck and the mire and the mess, God's word, his decrees, his promises come to us. We read his word and we trust the Holy Spirit. And nothing changes, right? It's a future promise that has not yet been realized. But the joy, the celebration in our lives should come, as Ryan said, right? We can be, we can be joyful in the middle of the mess. We can be joyful in the middle of this situation because God is faithful. 
and He is doing the work in and through us. And so nothing changed, but they're rejoicing and celebrating. Why? Because they recognize and realize their God had not forgotten them. Can I tell you that God hasn't forgotten you? You can feel forgotten, but He hasn't forgotten where you are, right? You can, you can go, oh my goodness, we, we have this discussion on the regular at our house, students. Oh my goodness, school. Ugh. Why do we have to go? And I want to just tell you, I want to just tell you, students, look at me, listen. I've been in other countries where you have not been given the opportunity to go to school, where you don't have the opportunity to graduate with a degree and to make a financial difference in your life. Not only a financial difference in your life, but maybe a financial difference across the world because of what God is doing in and through you. Do you hear me, students? Are you hearing me loud and clear? Like, listen, we all know, all of us adults know it's boring. We, don't, we didn't like it either. If, they, if your parents are saying they loved it, they're liars. I love them, but they're liars, right? We didn't love it either, but it's, it's your job. It's your duty. It's part of what you are going to do to be honored, to, to, to walk through this moment and to honor God with your life. You better just make the best of it and rejoice and celebrate while you're there. Adults, what situation are you in? Has God pressed you into something that you're like, oh my goodness, and you need to rejoice and celebrate. Now listen, rejoicing, I'm gonna, I, I don't mind making fun of myself uh, uh, you know, or doing something physical to, to, for you to laugh, right? Uh, rejoicing doesn't look like walking through life like this, <laughs> right? I mean, it doesn't, that, that is not rejo- right? That is not rejoicing, right? I'm just like, <laughs> like, we don't have to do a jig or be like, you know, Irish Scottish dance, like you don't have to clog through life, right? I'm just so happy. You know, I mean, that's just so, come on. But, because that's, that's ridiculous, right? There's a difference between happiness in our lives and a joy that is pressed down deep in who we are because we know that God, His promise, will never leave nor forsake us. Aren't you so glad? (sighs) Everybody else in this room could leave or forsake us, but He won't. He's trustworthy. Are we willing to rejoice? But are we also maybe... Maybe, like, I know these things are, sound like they're opposites, but, but are we willing to fear Him too? That He is a God who is worthy of our fear. And, and that word fear is, can, can be translated all throughout the Old Testament very differently, right? It could be an awestruck, right? An awestruck that we are amazed by Him. Why? Because He's God and we are not. Aren't you so glad? Aren't you so glad you don't have to spin this world around? You, you couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. We couldn't do it together. If we all put our hearts and souls and minds together, we could not do it. He is faithful. We need to walk in a healthy fear of the Lord. Let's continue reading into chapter uh, 9, and we'll close uh, this morning. So on March 7th, the dec- two decrees of the king were put into effect, the first one and the second one. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered the enemies. Now listen, this is clear. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the king's province to attack anyone who tried to harm them. Like they put themselves in a smart position to be to be on the defensive, right? But no one could make a stand against them, and everyone was afraid of them. Then it talks about the leaders. I I love this New New Living Translation for readability, but I miss saying all the governors, satraps, and prefects. Uh, I love that. I love that in the the different translation. But all the nobles of the provinces, the highest officers, the governors, and the royal officials helped the Jews for fear of Mordecai, right? Who came alongside, right? Those officials that are there in each of the provinces came alongside the Jews and they helped them. Why? Because they're fearing Mordecai. Verse 4 continues, why are they fearing him? For Mordecai had been promoted in the king's palace. He was second in command. And his fame spread throughout all the provinces as he became more and more powerful. This is the guy who was sitting at the gate at the beginning of the book. 
Now he's second in command. He's more and more powerful. So the Jews went ahead on the appointed day and struck down their enemies with the sword. They killed and annihilated their enemies and did as they pleased with those who hated them. In the fortress of Susa, so kind of the palace area itself, the Jews killed 500 men. They also killed Parshandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parsmatha, uh, uh, that one's a little difficult for me, sorry, Arisai, Aridai, and Vaisatha, uh, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not take any plunder. We'll come back to that in just a second. That very day, when the king was informed of the number of the people killed in the fortress of Susa, he called for Queen Esther and he said, The Jews have killed 500 men in the fortress of Susa alone, as well as Haman's 10 sons. If they have done that here, what has happened in the rest of the provinces, right? You can't know instantly, so they're probably going to get the reports as they come in. But now, what more do you want? It will be granted to you. Tell me and I will do it. Esther responded, if it pleases the king, give the Jews in Susa uh, permission to do again tomorrow as they have done and let the bodies of Haman's son, ten sons be impaled on a pole. So the king agreed and the decree was announced in Susa. So they could announce it right there in the city. It wasn't spread, but just there. And they impaled the bodies of Haman's ten sons. Then the Jews gathered together on March 8th and killed 300 more men. And again, they took no plunder. Meanwhile, the other Jews throughout the king's provinces had gathered together to defend their lives. They gained relief from all their enemies, killing 75,000 of those who hated them, but they did not take any plunder. This was done throughout the provinces on March 7th, and on March 8th they rested, celebrating their victory on a day of feasting and gladness. The Jews at Susa killed their enemies on March 7th, and again on March 8th, and then rested on March 9th, making that their day of feasting and gladness. So to this day, rural Jews living in remote villages celebrate an annual festival and holiday on the appointed day in late winter when they rejoice and send gifts of food to each other. And then we'll talk next week about the festival of Purim. Let me, Purim, let me give you the fourth and final division of the book. It's the edict results. The edict results. Listen, there's the defeat of those who tried to overtake the Jews. We see that. 500 killed one day, 300 the next, 75,000 on the first day in all of the provinces. The people were afraid of the Jews. The leaders feared Mordecai. He was now famous and more powerful. The sons of Haman are murdered. And it says after that, and then it says in two other areas, no plunder was taken. This harkens back, another one of those threads. This harkens back to 1 Samuel 15. Remember, we talked about it one of the Sundays we gathered where in 1 Samuel 15, Saul is the king. And Saul is told to kill uh, the king of the Agagites and the community and take no plunder. And Samuel comes and he sees him and the king, Agag, who is a relative of Haman, the son of Hamaditha, the Agagite, he doesn't take uh, his stuff. He doesn't, or he ta- he doesn't listen to God and say, "Don't take the plunder." But he leaves the king alive. And then there's sheep that are around. And uh, Samuel says to Saul in one of the best lines of the whole chapter of First Samuel 15, "What is the bleeding of sheep that I hear?" Right? They were supposed to kill it all, give it all to the Lord. Plunder it is not to be taken and do. And so in this moment where they are murdering Haman and they have the opportunity, remember that what did the edict say? And take the plunder, right? And in that moment they say, no, we're not going to do that. Just a couple weeks ago in my daily Bible reading, I read about the moment where David said, listen, I will not take something from me, from from you that costs me nothing, right? And he's like, listen, they're like, hey, we're not going to take that plunder. And by the end of the chapter, we see that the king, sadly, Xerxes, is still abdicating, giving up his throne, and the authority comes back. And he's like, hey, what else can we do? And they're like, hey, can we, in this city, in Susa, make sure that we defend ourselves again tomorrow? And then we see this celebration. Let me give us kind of two points of application, and then we will be done early and on time, uh, because that's the best thing I can give you for Mother's Day. Amen? And then uh, we won't have to move everything today because it's summer here at this school. So we'll move just some of the sound stuff back into the trailer. We'll move some of the other things and we'll be, we'll be done. So uh, let me give us two points of application. First is this, celebration and joy. 
And then the second is fear of God. Let me just ask you the question, how good are you at celebrating? How good at you are celebrating? How good are you? Like, I want to ask the question, just like no no spiritual value here, right, at all. Uh, Are you good at celebrating like when it comes to like throwing a party for someone? You don't want me to be your party planner, right? If I'm going to throw a party at at some point, like uh, Ann and I will be 44 this year, we'll uh, we'll be 50 at some point, right? I will not be planning our 50th birthday party, right? Uh, and that's, that's just not, it's not in my bag. I'm not good at doing that, right? Are you good at that? Are you good at celebrating in that way? Are you, are you kind of a good celebrator? Do you do that? Like even gift giving, I'm terrible. If I buy you a gift, I'm going to give it to you tomorrow, right? Like, I mean, it's like, let me be like, oh, well, this is, what is this for? I don't know. When's your birthday? Just think of it for then. Like if I just, I mean, I send text messages out to people. Uh, like I'll see something randomly somewhere and I'll take a picture of it and I'll send a text message to you. Uh, uh, we had uh, the Wilsons here last week. We were at a ball game for uh, Ethan and I saw Southern College of Optometry uh, and I took a picture and I sent it to them, right? I'll, I'll just be randomly doing that. I will do that for people. I'm, ce- I'm a good celebrator in that way, rememberer of things, but I'm not a good at celebrating. How good are you at celebrating? Listen, we will talk more about this next week and on Memorial Day and the second week of the fruit of the Spirit because I think God's maybe doing something for us. But, uh, but we're going to talk about joy. We're going to talk about celebration and joy. And that does joy and celebration exude out of who and what you are? Does it just kind of like come out of your pores? Like, man, I'm, I just want to exude joy and celebration. Why? Because we should be party people as followers of Jesus Christ right? That should be who we are. And joy is not a momentary feeling, but it's a state of being for the believer because we have the most to celebrate. Jesus lived, died, was buried, rose again on the third day, and is now sitting at the right hand of God. We got a lot to celebrate. Are you a good celebrator? Can I tell you, this is one of the prayers that I pray for our church, um, that we would be great celebrators. Like that we would be known as a church of celebration. That last week, I was so glad we didn't have to like say, now clap for these baptisms, y'all. Now clap for these, right? No, I mean, it's just, uh, just unreal. Blown away. Are we good at celebrating? I'm praying that for us, that we would be a church of celebration and joy. That we would, you know, I'm thankful. I, I looked around and said, hey, Ryan, help us clap this morning on that song. Uh, some of you are from, uh, you're just in the wrong hemisphere. Uh, you should be in Central America. They clap on one and three. Uh, and some of us clap on two and four, like the song's supposed to be. But if you just keep clapping, we'll do one, two, three, four. It'll be all good, right? But we, we should be those people, right? Clap your hands, all ye people. Why? Because Jesus has redeemed us and celebrated us. He celebrated, we should celebrate him because he has given us new life in Christ. Celebration and joy. Um, This week, um, would you be willing to examine your life and ask the question, how good am I doing at celebration and joy? How good am I doing at celebration and joy? Listen, some some weeks are knuckle-dragger weeks, right? Had them. Like you said, Frank, you've had them in ministry as a pastor? Yes. Yes, had knuckle dragger weeks. Sometimes just you got to get the things done. You got to get the things done. But in that moment, I want to exude joy even in that moment. Second is the fear of God. Fear of God. And I know that we, we talked a little bit about it. That it's not just fear, it's awe. It's, it's being uh, just kind of enraptured by who and what he is. Uh, Proverbs 9 10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Aren't you so glad? This is where we start, right? It's not where we finish, but it's where we start. All of us started our believing lives with fear of the Lord. Sometimes, you know, it's a good reason to go to, uh, to believe in Jesus. You don't want to go to hell, right? I don't want to go to hell. I want to believe in Jesus, right? A lot of, a lot of people, that's what started their faith. Hey, I want, to, I want to step out of hell and into heaven. That's a good reason to give your life to Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you, thank God he doesn't leave us there. This is where we start. It's not where we finish. Fearing God because he's the creator and sustainer, but soon realizing that he is also the loving father who adopts us into his family and wants to bless us abundantly with relationship first and the use of his resources second. 
Let me read that again. Fearing God because he is the creator and sustainer, but soon realizing he is our loving father who adopts us into his family. He is a good, good father, and he wants to bless us abundantly with a relationship first and the use of his resources second. Listen, when I say we're a blessed people, I mean this. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And because I have an intimate relationship with him and because I try and live open-handed, he blesses us with his resources and we can be blessed to be a blessing. Amen? We need the fear of God in our lives. Listen, Moses' words to Joshua have been ringing true uh, all throughout Scripture in my daily Bible reading. Be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord will be with you wherever you go this morning. Psalm 67. May God be merciful and bless us. May His face smile with us, uh, with favor on us. May your ways be known throughout the earth, your saving power among people everywhere. Talking about the nations again. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole wor world sing for joy, because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Then the earth will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will richly bless us. Yes, God will bless us, and people all over the world will fear Him. That's what we're called to do. So let me ask you the three questions we've been asking let me give you the simple way for us to follow after him, and I'm going to pray. Question number one, am I still on the journey forward, or have I found myself settling when I should have been advancing? Now, I think sometimes we think this for like oh, a long time ago. I'm saying this week. Have, have This week, have you, have you settled when you should have been advancing for the kingdom of God? Have joy and celebration, the fear of the Lord, been part of your life? Question number two, if you are not where you want to be, why do you keep choosing to stay where you you are. Another way you could say this is, is that insanity is the, is the, or, or choosing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results, right? Why do we stay doing the same thing when God is trying by his, by his word and by his power of his Holy Spirit to change us into what we should be, not where we are? Question number three, what will it take to jar you out of the security of where you are to pursue what can be obtained only in an un- certain future. Have you started the journey by fearing God? Have you started the journey by fearing God? Saying, I'm not him. I admit I'm a sinner. I believe that he is a savior and I will confess and commit my life to him. If not, then today you can believe in Jesus who is God in the flesh coming down to save us from our sins. Belief in Jesus is as simple as A, B, or C. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is and then confess and commit. You say, Frank, I don't know the Bible. I don't know all that God has done. I'm not a great celebrator or fearing of him. Uh, and I want to just tell you today, you can take the first step. You don't have to take all thousand steps today. Aren't you so glad? Some of you who are control freaks, some of you who want to have the plan for the next 10 years. All I can say is just breathe. <laughs> Sit Indian style in the grass somewhere and just breathe. I don't know anything that will help you to do because you don't have to have all million steps. Just have the first one. Jesus, I believe in you. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you are who you say you are, that you are the Savior of the world. You are the perfect Son of God that came and took my sins upon you and then confess and commit. But a lot of us in this room, we have believed in Jesus Christ. We have walked faithfully for years and I want to tell you the same way that you uh, came to Jesus is the first time is the same way that you walk with him. So then, just as you believed in Jesus, continue to live your life in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthen the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Are you continuing to walk in faith with him? Continue. Listen, sometimes continuing looks like uh, drowning, right? Let's just be honest. Just looks like this. <coughs> And sometimes continuing looks like this, right? I do neither well, uh, 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 but, but it, that's what it looks like. Sometimes it's just continuing. Is I'm just trying to make it. 
I can tell you what continuing always looks like. Continuing always looks like the Holy Spirit coming alongside us and walking with us and for us, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, coming alongside us and walking with us. How well are you listening, hearing, and following and heeding the Holy Spirit? Jesus said this, and I've been mulling it over in my mind a lot lately. Um, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Listen, I'm just going to tell you, no man in here uh, wants to be made to do anything, right? I'd rather you ask me, but I'll make you do it. Like, oh, no, you're not, right? Sometimes ladies, you're the same way, right? I do No, I'm not doing that. But I want to tell you, when Jesus makes us do something, I'm willing to yield to it. Why? Because he is our perfect son given on our behalf. Would you be willing to trust him? And let's celebrate this week. Listen, something's going to happen this week. It's going to get you down. Celebrate. Not this, but this moment that no matter what's going on, he's not left me or forsaken me. Would you join me as we pray? And then Randall's going to come and dismiss us. Father, we just, we just trust you. God, we're terrible. Let me rephrase that. God, I'm terrible at this sometimes. Sometimes, Father, I, my what's walking, what I'm walking through or what's coming next is bigger than... Um, it, and sometimes in my mind, it's bigger than who you are. Lord, I know that's not true. Lord, sometimes uh, uh, while I might be a happy uh, person, a glass half full guy, Lord, sometimes I just fail in um, not celebrating you and the great things that you're doing. So Lord, this week I want to confess my sin. And God, I pray that we as, as a people would confess our sin and lay our sin at your feet. And God, thank you that, that you, you separated as far as the east is from the west. Lord, today I just pray that you would be honored and glorified by what we say and do this week. And God, that you would call us to be found faithful. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.